When scripture is held sacred in this way, it is often used as a weapon with sections electively chosen to support arguments that divide rather than connect us. Because it does not hold up to diverse experience. The diverse experience that I believe is inherent in God's creation. So in order to lift up the reverence and the veneration that is owed the sacredness that is owed to the wise words of the world's religions, we must take them down off the shelf, take them out of the protective covering and fragile casing that we have created for them, and hold them up to the light of reason and experience, revealing their true divinity. And this is a divinity that extends beyond the words between the cover. It is a divinity that lies between the reader and the text. And it is not bound solely to the lines on the page. The poet laureate Billy Collins told us to take the poem and hold it up to the light, take a, like a color slide or press an ear up against its hive, to drop a mouse into the poem and watch him probe his way out, or to walk inside the poem's room and feel for the light switch. Why would we not also want to do the same thing with Scripture? It only increases its value. It only increases its sacredness. If we seek the points where our lives and the text meet. Now, Billy Collins goes on to say, but all some want to do is tie it and bind it to a chair with a rope and torture a confession out of it. This is unfortunate. It is limiting, and who the heck do we think we are? <laughs> it is restricting the holy, and frankly, it's just sad. Now, one text that kept ringing in my ears as I've pondered this sermon this week has been John chapter 1, verse 1. You probably know it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, grammatically, based on the Greek and the tense and the case in which this verse is appearing, the last phrase could read either, the word was God, or the word was a God. Some translations like to preserve that sense of ambiguity by translating it, the word was divine. Or another one I really like is, what God was, the word also was. Now, with this sermon, I'm just left screaming, yes, that is absolutely true. There was a time when we worshiped the Word, when the Word was worshiped as a God, when God was equal to the Word, or at least that's how religion was being lived out. But now? But now? See, in the Christian scriptures, they go on to suggest that, guess what happened next? Jesus came. And when Jesus came, according to the Christian scriptures, that changed everything. He was the life, the living word. His visit to earth broke those bonds that made the law infallible. He was the life, the one with whom we could be in relationship, a living being that was not bound to a text. The one who dined with tax collectors and prostitutes and who healed on the Sabbath. A carpenter who likely built crosses upon which others were hanged. Jesus, who struggled with his own path, with his own choices in life, who was angry at times and full of contradictions and love and forgiveness. Yeah. <laughs> who led by example of holding up his own life to the law and then made choices based on those involved and on the circumstance. Jesus, who did not deny his own experience, even when it contradicted his own Jewish traditions. 
and who struggled with these choices and this feeling of being forsaken by God. See, it is in these stories, in these contradictions, in the struggle that I find the Christian scriptures to be the most accessible, the most relevant to my own life, the most sacred, the most holy. It is in Jesus' struggle not only with his divinity, but also with his humanity. It is in the struggle between his life and the law. That is has expanded my understanding of God. And you can do this with all the scriptures, taking them and turning them over and over in your mind and holding them up to your life's experience. So then why? Why do some choose to worship the Bible instead of the God to whom it directs us? even when it explicitly says not to place any idols before God. Make up your mind. Why? Because it's old? Terrible reason. Because their parents did? Because so many others claim that it's literal truth with such conviction? Because of the threat of what might happen to them if they do not? Well, it is true that there there are real consequences, especially in this state, to moving away from the literal. There are. Including losing one's community and friendships and straining relationships with family, not to mention the the difficulty of a path of uncertainty when the foundation of our lives is not laid out specifically And it crumbles beneath us. So we have to rebuild our understanding of ourselves and our world. When we must reconstruct a new meaning and reconnect with people and learn to trust our own experience of the world again. Why why is it, though, that in so many other areas of knowledge, we see so easily that we have to filter our meaning-making and pass it through the fire of our own experience. It's so clear in other contexts that there is no single source when it comes to describing the human experience of anything. For example, you might guess that I've been reading a little bit about birth, like 30 books. And at the same time, I know that in the depths of my being, and mothers are not shy in this congregation to tell me, that it does not matter how many books I read. I have no idea what I am in for. I have no real concept of what my own birth experience is going to be like. That seems so obvious, right? So why would we also not hold up any text concerning our most valuable relationship, our relationship with the Spirit, our relationship with God? Why would we not hold up any text concerning our relationship to the sacred in this same way? Why would we not be interested in the wisdom of those who've come before us and still give authority to our own discernment, to our own intuition, to our own life's experience. Why would we not do that? Are the scriptures valuable? Yes. Are they enlightening and inspiring and strengthening and empowering? Yes. Yes. Are they sacred? Yes. Are they infallible? No. Are they literally true for everyone? Certainly not. So where does our scripture as religious liberals come from, and what can we deem as sacred? See, I want to make sure that you walk away from this sermon clear, that I do, in fact, hold scripture sacred, just not so sacred that it's infallible, just not so sacred that it's not worthy of taking my own life and putting it next to it. It's not untouchable. It's sacred as in holy. 